in the yard for me. We have cherry turnovers and we'll pull a little bit of the So it's uh, a lot better than this. It is just good to be back, second day. Um, you had homework. Um, I'm not going to ask how many people did it, but you're going to ask how you did it because I'm going to put you in group. So you're going to have to pay. Find your um, gold rush group. Uh, if you have your little aspect of the team, let's look at actually has it. Take this with you. You're going to need that. But if you don't have to, you pretend that you did it and say that you did it and remember what you wrote down on it. Um, find your gold rush group, get up, get with your group, and then tell you really want to do this with you. Mentally handicapped? Yeah, that's awesome. Jeff, I didn't
Just the cultural grab by him. Favorites in there. You know, you always know that you know that. You always have to think about you all the way back. You sell this kind of thing. All the kind of people.
covered uh, down uh, south and west of here in, in New Mexico, sure, and then found all over there. Uh, that's now been uh, severely bothered to death. Uh, and the question now is, were there earlier peoples? Uh, and the answer to that almost certainly is yes. There were people earlier in the place. And then the more uh, competing question, the more difficult question, how did we get here? <coughs> Uh, good part of the evidence today suggests that a uh, strong speculation today is that they moved down the coast, the Pacific coast, uh, using uh, early crafts, moving down the Pacific coast, and then uh, and then later came down to that area that I've uh, talked about. There's also some speculation, I actually can't figure out how in the world this could have happened, but there's also um, speculation that they moved across the Atlantic, they came over from uh, Europe, uh, maybe over here. The, uh, the East Coast, uh, at least as earlier, perhaps earlier, than the major over in the American West. In any case, it's all in the air right now. It's like very, very um, to be around and to be aware of and to be following all of the different problems. Any other questions for you? Okay, we're talking about feathers. The feather trade. Uh, there's an article I ran across a couple years ago. They were able to trace, in fact, a lot of the trade of feathers uh, from the Mexican coast, Gulf Coast, up through let's say northern Mexico, and then channeling up into the into the American Southwest. They just uh, all over the place. So the fan of their national monument, uh, you will see up on the walls, pepper lists, uh, little carpets, pictures of uh, macaws, uh, of Latin American, Central American uh, birds that they brought up here to the flat that uh, uh, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I believe yesterday you had a, uh, uh, you're very lucky to have a presentation by Mark Beasley, is that right? Mark's uh, quite wonderful. <laughs> He's very, very good. I hope you have a chance to, uh, to read his excellent, uh, excellent good work. Uh, we had a conference call, and uh, Mark said that he was going to try to introduce the question of environmental history general. Why in the world would we study it? What is it? Uh, and why is it, why is it important? Uh, as Lynn said, I, I like the like the way uh, this book of this is really a kind of an exchange between the human and the non-human. Now, people affect the world around us. We cannot possibly do anything but that. We cannot act in any way without in some way, in some minor way or huge way, affecting the world around us. And then how, in turn, uh, the changed world affects us, opens up possibilities, closes opportunities, causes uh, opportunities, um, causes challenges. What better time in the world right now to be, to be aware of that, of how uh, drastically our world is changing on this circuit because of human interaction with that. It's kind of like a conversation. You know, kind of conversation that we have with each other, real conversation. Not those ones you have, you know, when you're talking to someone and you look in your eyes and realize they are not listening to what you're saying. <laughs> But the conversations where you, you're, you're, you're talking to someone and you look at them and you realize they're absorbing it. They're taking it in. And then they, some minor way or great way, are changed for a good aha moment. Or some minor way, but they cannot have a true conversation without being changed in some way. And then you apply, you apply out of that change. And your reply then, or that person's reply, changes you. So this is like a conversation between us and the non-human world around us. And that conversation has been going on since people have been on Earth. But environmental history is the history of that conversation, history of that exchange. But what I'd like, this is my topic, is environmental history and American Indian history in the United States, and specific, more specifically in the West. I'd like to riff off that. Uh, what, uh, what Mark was talking about yesterday. I'd like to talk about that and, and to focus in zero in uh, to the question of how this, what, what this um, way of looking at the past can teach us, suggest some of the ways for how this way of looking at the past teach us about Indian history. And now that in turn perhaps could open our eyes to the larger story uh, of the American West uh, and the United States. I'd like to talk about uh, two topics. Uh, the first one, uh, it's kind of a macro topic, a very big topic. And now we'll uh, use the second one to sort of focus in on something a little more specific. It's more specific to the 19th century, the century you're focusing on here, more specific to uh, the Great Plains, where we are. Where we are. 
saying, but as most of the answer to that question, most of the way we answer that question, yes, has been on strictly human terms. He has came and conquered and settled and just as necessary. Native people who want to hear the respond to that, died off, but strictly a human story. 
But Crosby was saying is that it was so much more than that. So much more than that. What was it? Two, to bring, or to bring in the rest of that, you've got to think of it in environmental terms. That is how those how human consequences would be paid so much attention. And the non-human consequences that you talked about. Converse. That the Columbia Exchange refers to what happened when suddenly these two worlds were brought together and there's this extraordinary contact again. What follows from <coughs> Those two worlds were separated, as I said, for 10,000 years. 10,000 years. 10,000 years in terms of long-term evolution is, you know, it's a flip of a second. But it's long enough for very important things to develop, both in human terms and in non-human terms. <coughs> but during those three and 10,000 year break, the great changes in both of those worlds. Some of them those two worlds are brought together. And that brought together was not just two different sets of cultures and civilizations. What was brought together were two biota. Biota meaning the whole of life in a particular place. Everything. From the tiniest microbes to our descendants. The biota. Just as there were two sets of cultures. When you brought together, the biota of the subject is brought together. The B-I-O-T-A Yes, it's here. All right. So that was the Columbia Exchange. That's what that refers to. Columbia referred to what happened in the consequence of Columbia. Exchange in terms of that's the third, third point. So often when we talk about, talk about this and wrote about this and talk about this in the past in human terms, so often it's been a one way of treatment, one way influence that is from east to west. It happens when all these folks in the old world turned into what we call the new world. The only thing you have is a change with a two way influence. And what we call the new world is influencing the old world as much as the old world influencing the new. So I've got those big points there. Okay, so what, what this specifically are we talking about? Huh? Thank you. <laughs> so, what are the consequences? So let's look at it in both of those directions. First, the one that we usually pay so little to the part of the message, the West to East. West to East. In terms of what moves from the New World to the Old World. Now, uh, while this was a, an equal exchange in one sense, <coughs> as it was going in both ways, it was unequal, unequal in the sense that certain categories of things were far more prominent in one way than the other. And in terms of west to east, the most important things that made trip across the Atlantic from west to east for plants. Plants. Especially food plants. Plants that people ate. But for reasons that I'll uh, go into a little bit more detail later. Indian peoples, peoples of the New World, uh, I, think it, I think it's fair to say, were farther advanced than people in the old world 
for developing a range of domestic plants, cultivated food the crops. They said more of them, more of them, a greater variety. Now the reason for that, the basic reason for that, is in the hands of the is that the, that the old world, the people in Africa and Asia, were far more advanced than the new world in domesticated animals. The Indians had very, very few domesticated animals. The consequences of saying we did more they need more food, but plants to eat. They had this greater variety, greater amount. And these plants, uh, this is the most important aspect of the quality exchange going from west to east. Food plants. Like corn. What we call corn. Or technically Indian corn or maize. And they are the corn in European uh, context. When we say core, we think of this. There were hundreds, hundreds of varieties of corn in the Western Hemisphere at the time of the uh, kind of the Corn is an uh, extremely efficient food source for several reasons. First, it's very, very high in certain things that people need. Take it from our items. It can grow in a great variety of climates, in a great variety of soil, or the corn or corn. Okay, there's a lot to eat in it. Now, what you see here, what we call, when you think corn, you think of corn as the ear of corn, and what we eat from the ear of corn are corn kernels. Well, those are but what you're really eating, you eat corn on the cob, what you're really eating is grass seed, corn is grass. So what Indian people have done, starting in Central Mexico, and I'm going to get to that 7,000 years ago, they began cultivating and domesticating corn, and they talked about that law. But the real mystery is around the world, they saw the potential of the table. Wheat. And they cultivated that and they threw it in the bread and stuff like that. So who did it wrong? It spread out of Central Mexico, southward of South America, northward into North America, the United States. The corn was being cultivated when, when the uh, folks that showed up to settle the Atlantic Coast, but they found some of the Atlantic Coast cultivated in the North of the Future and the Garden of the Time. All the folks. And uh, pretty quickly, the Indians found out that this was a very valuable crop to have. And so they took it back. And they began to <coughs> cultivate the old world, spread across the old world, and it's from east to the day. This is one of the most common domesticated plants on earth. It came from Indians. Potatoes originated in northern South America, from the Incas and others. Like corn, uh, there are many, many different varieties of potatoes. And like corn, uh, that's even more so than corn. Potatoes can grow in, um, in conditions that most of the plants do not, most of the domestic plants do not. Potatoes can grow in cool, wet climates. They can grow in soil that is not nearly uh, good enough for other kinds. For a hardy plant, it's packed by some sorts of fungi and so forth. The possibility Europeans discovered the potatoes, like corn. It can all sorts of things that could not have so they began to call for potatoes and they can get them out. Potatoes rapidly spread first across Europe and then across uh, much of the especially northern northern hemisphere. Today, for example, we call the associated terms of other countries. I don't know. Associate of potatoes, both of Irish. Irish potatoes. In fact, there's good news. The reason for that, the Irish Ireland, the human country, but a country that has a climate that is not very 
really well suited uh, for agriculture. Our intense support takes very, very well back to the 19th century. Uh, the poor are uh, the ones who rely on the biggest uh, good degree in the degree for disasters, including the famine. Uh, and some of them have been away from the time on a hundred thousand. Sorry to them. It's estimated by some historians that the typical adult <coughs> male in Ireland, eight and forty out of the state famine, ate on average daily about 10 pounds of potatoes. We have a grocery store to get with a big potatoes. But Ireland is not the country where um, the leading producer of potatoes has been. No, far away from the greatest producer of tuna of potatoes. I know what that is. Russia. Russia. I've never been to Russia. Uh, but I've uh, been to have say that uh, I've often been out of state potatoes. I've been going to well, vodka, in fact, is, uh, is uh, <laughs> true vodka. It's full of vodka. True vodka is uh, still from the face of that. Of course, the terrible spirit of the question is how to get the possibility of that. Both of the pockets are the same. Indians being Russians and vodka. <laughs> okay, uh, tomatoes. Tomatoes uh, also came out of uh, South, South America. For a long time, considered poisonous. In the 19th century, those people finally uh, came to understand. And in fact, uh, the leaves are. Tomatoes, I mean, uh, tomatoes are a variety of, uh, of uh, nightshade, which acts as poisonous plant. Okay. Uh, so uh, don't eat any, if you grow tomatoes, don't eat the leaves. But eat the tomatoes, not for those that you grow. Uh, do not eat the tomatoes in stores, because those are not tomatoes. I'm not sure what they are. Brown, tasteless, red things. But the tomatoes that come from, uh, from South America. And of course, they call it spread to the is uh, one of the most important plants of sub-Saharan Africa, like tropical and subtropical Africa. We do have it here, we call it something else, a uh, tapioca. Very high protein, peanut butter, 
Um, soybeans. They were popular with people. Beans. Green beans. They were kind of beans. Probably not very well. Probably came uh, from originally with Indian peoples. And like peanuts, uh, very, very high in protein. So if you're vegetarian, you know that you want to eat the waste. So many kinds of stuff. We just think of color, color, green, yellow. <laughs> they're like, they're really like, it's pumpkin, it's pumpkin, pumpkin, it's squash. Um, squash, cultivated all over, all over the new world. A squash, a very important plant um, in the uh, uh, diet of this area. So a few, oh, can you put them in the plane for a lot of time? But it was a gathering. We did not cultivate. Just going back along the Arkansas River, there were there were certainly um, people living along the uh, here, so the corner of the county, practice work there, and on the fifty four, pumpkins, slosh. When it showed up, I think I got a line from somewhere. But, uh, they they gave it. So somewhere that was expected for the city to go to work. That's it. It's always a, it's always disappointing to have to go you can't just pump it. <laughs> so, um, this is this one. Cotton. Now, cotton, uh, in fact, cotton was found in both hemispheres. But there are different varieties of cotton. Two basic varieties, what they call long staple cotton, that was the kind that was mostly in the old world. Long staple cotton that was found in the Middle East and parts of Africa. Long staple cotton uh, is a much higher grade, much higher quality. Really, really fine cotton goods uh, are made from long staple cotton. But uh, that's, it's fairly limited where you can grow it. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of most of the goods, that's short staple cotton. Short staple cotton is how we think about this is short staple cotton. Short staple cotton uh, originated in the New World. But another contributing. Here's a plant then, that the uh, Indians gave the rest of the world and not the food uh, that's a fire. Sturdy divots here holding into place. Um, 
as far as uh, style, we move on the uh, style of a, a pants used by Longshore in Italy, specifically Juno. Uh, and as far as material, he used a cotton fabric uh, from the city of Nini, or the Corsair de Nini, in Juno. Corsair de Nini, Juno. Uh, the style of Genoese jeans, <laughs> and he chose sort of a stylish blue uh, of the garden. Well, so the way we've got my turn to style in Italy, uh, fabric of France, slack. In the Yes? I'd love to get you to a couple of my stories on my high school. Oh, yeah, this is kind of commercial where they traded for a car and home and they prepared for American people. And uh, he said it shifts after like the you know, sales for a while. Yes. Because he did the tear. But he said the original design had rivets in the uh, garage. And that when they would sit around the fire and just put the rivets in the garage, the rivets would fall out, but they'd get hot. And then you stood up and you'd have a branding. It's a story that I'll never forget. <laughs> <laughs> I saw one. Okay, so I've got um, this case of uh, fabrics, not just a food of fabrics. Chocolate. Chocolate. South America. So, the next time you sit down for dinner, ask yourself, how much of this uh, is the result of this uh, colonial exchange? The style that you're eating it is probably the European. The flesh you're eating probably originated in our side. If it's plain. If you're eating meat, uh, it's probably not. It's probably part of the other exchange. You look at that in the but there were a few animals that made their way from uh, west to east. A few domesticated animals. There were very, very few domesticated animals here. A lot of them, turkeys. Turkeys made their way. Visually, fairly popular. Turkeys seen by English uh, or uh, in Egypt. At that time, the 17th century, uh, the Middle East stood for everything that was exotic and weird. And uh, a sort of a shorthand term for the Middle East was Turkey. So if something was seen as very, very odd, very exotic and weird. Of Turkish, actually Turkish. So this is first of all a Turkish bird. And it's actually kind of prominent. Raccoons, now very prominent in, uh, in especially northern Europe. Well, it's been really large, but it's probably the largest during World War II. So it's a bigger kind of way for a highly tender. Not much else. Turkeys, dogs, guinea pigs, that's another. And the domestic animals. Very few. So, the west, the east side of the planet, the, the quite uneven in this sense. Far more plants going from west to east than animals going from west to east. But this had a huge impact. Revolutionized the world diet. One of the things you call it is this. They count differently the world eats because of this. And this revolution in diet was one, only one, but 
one and one very important factor in this extraordinary rise of world population after Columbia time. All sorts of other reasons. Certainly, one reason for this great rise in world population is the fact that we were simply far more efficient than the year before. The whole world population was so rapidly. Once the space plants literally take root, we can the whole continent. Terrifying graphs of food. Most of it comes, of course, after the flood of the They cut that up, and then it really takes up. Some of these reasons, of course. But this is the one of them. Here, this impact of human diet. The facts of your people to be the best. Okay. Put the other way, in the direction we normally think of in terms of, uh, in terms of contact, east and west, that is from the old world to the new world. As was true with the first, uh, it's a bit unequal. Contact exchange, uh, the, the movement of things was much greater in certain categories than in others. Now, there were certainly plants that made their way from east to west. Okay, so, the brain, again, we're talking about grass here, basically domesticated grass. This is corn, this is domesticated grass, so it is wheat. Wheat developed in the old world and moved into the new world. So when you drive across Kansas, see wheat fields, as I did yesterday, driving up from uh, uh, this is an old world thing that has made its way here and become part of it and helped revolutionize the diet. Another grass is rice. Associated mostly, of course, with Asia, but um, the United States. This is considerable amount of rice. It has to have a certain particular climate and geography. Uh, Let's say it's for rice. Please say that. Please say that. Oh, Arkansas. Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Arkansas. Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Arkansas. Mm -hmm. But, uh, it's a very good thing about Arkansas. It is uh, food from Minnesota. Folks won't do it. 
So the answer to that was African slavery. African slavery in the New World and its origins in the sugar trade. Without the period of slavery, far away, those slaves came from Africa to the New World, came to uh, sugar trade. West Indies, and the North and South Africa. Only 6% came to the West Indies. 90% of the West Coast, most of it, Nearly as important as animals, not nearly as, as many varieties of plants as were going in the other direction. On the other hand, uh, the old world gave to the new world far more animals than came in the middle of the And this was a great impact, one of two great impacts of this side of the Animals. Uh, most domesticated animals that you can think of came from, came from the old world to the new world. Starting the fourth second presentation, I have for you uh, that this week's proposal is going to impact on this particular trip. But, uh, and there's a certain retirement here, which, of course, is a good one in this piece here. Uh, really, kind of cold. But in human terms, uh, they were introduced as something good. Fourth, cattle. Pigs have gone out to a conference in our 
So, uh, think of the consequences of this. That would be the consequences of the world without us. Talk about movement of corn and potatoes and nuts and many other things. But from the peace, think of the consequences for the history of the world generally and certainly of two worlds. But horses, cattle, sheep, goats, rats, worms. The world was and then we changed. Radically changed. Radically changed. This word off this piece. Radical. Uh, radical. You can be uh you know like the word radix, the root, like radish. You can radix, radish and radical, whatever it words. Radical change is changed from the root spot. That's just what's by literal into plants. Human society, human culture, and both across the planet, both in exchange from the roots up of the Columbia, the Columbia. Any questions on this? <coughs> okay. Um, well, uh, there was another aspect of this. Also unintentional. Start to look at my level costumes. This one invisible. But this one <coughs> uh, consequences <coughs> consequences that uh, are even greater in terms of uh, in terms of human history, in terms of human impact than the others. At least certainly in the first uh, in the first uh, hundred years. So I call here the Great Five. Cause. Change included not only plants and not only animals that we could see, but it included also animals that we could not see. It included animals on the microscopic level, species on the microscopic level. They too were part of the biota, the biota of the of both of those species. And even more dramatic than the other two, this exchange from east to west was far greater 
this impact of east to west is far greater than from west to east. Because in the old world, maybe we were far more animals than we were before. The old world, maybe we were far, far more diseases than the new world gave the new world. And this imbalance resulted in, I think, what I would argue, I think, contributed to what I think would be the worst thing that has ever happened in recorded human history. The first time. What are you talking about? So, in 1492, October 10th, 1492, uh, the old world was home, was doomed with disease, with diseases that we are quite familiar with today, with diseases that did not exist in the new world. Not to say, all be careful. Uh, seeing the world in these people who were a steamy place where nobody fought each other and everybody lived in harmony with God's work that all fun. And you all had that disease. Didn't have any of these diseases. These diseases in the old world could be categorized, could be uh, grouped. <coughs> In two parts, two <laughs> sorts. One are called, the first group are called vector diseases. This is one. A vector disease is a disease that is transmitted from a person, from person to person through a third party. Some other organs delivery system. Most probably insects. <clears throat> so the difference between the two I have to do with how the diseases are transferred immediately. If I have a vector disease, I can give it to you only if there is this other participant. Period. This is one effect of the parasite. That's a uh, It is one of uh, the human impact of three or two forms of malaria. Malaria is the greatest killer in the world today, far away. More people die, more people will die today. Of malaria. They died in all of the attacks on the people. Most of them killed. Them. And most of them in Africa. Africa below the Sahara. And we can create efforts today to figure out ways to control this horrible, horrible epidemic. Based on this, there are millions and millions and millions of problems that search in Africa. It's a very, very old disease. Originated in Africa, or it's hard to say exactly how long it's been around, but at least a couple of hundred thousand years. Now, second, so it's tropical climate is the great question. I'm aware that we have in this part of the world of this movie projects. And we feel it and go. Of pain, uh, and I can feel it far less often. It's transmitted by uh, various kinds of mosquitoes, but this is the great killer. Now, if you can't be out, you can probably get some rats and get some Africa. Very handy. Diseases are viruses. This group of virus uh, it, uh, it causes the virus, it causes the disease of low fever. Still, 
still around today, or affect your control today, but still the killer today is certain parts of the world, like in the case that will be in the place for a long time. So one time, it is one of the great killers of this time. First, epidemics in American history were of Philadelphia in the 1790s. Um, on the Gulf Coast, almost annually, something very, very bad in the Gulf Coast, and then close to the problems. The worst in American history, uh, in all of American history, <coughs> in the 1870s, and all of Mexico, Memphis, 5,000 people died in Memphis by 1938, from the old people of the United States. And they died from this one particular piece of paper. It was a virus that attacks various organs, uh, especially the liver. And the liver uh, is affected in the eyes, and the jaundice, and the yellow. That's the uh, one. Uh, the liver dies, uh, the blood that normally goes to the liver, the ball of blood, uh, is redirected, especially into the stomach, uh, and the vessels. Some of them cannot handle the traffic, and they burst, and it fills the blood um, and to regurgitate uh, the blood to the air black, the air thing for the people that's not black. 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 And that happens uh, with very high attack rate, uh, very high mortality rate. <coughs> Much more recently, West Nile. The West Nile virus. Transmitted by the Heels. Once again, this was the same guy. And since West Nile, of course, is quite recent, since it's quite recent, we can get a sense of how this works. Here's an example of a disease that really appeared only first in 1992. But now we can make a practice far more effectively to put our own practice way back then. To get a sense of how this how this operated. As the um, as the as the disease spreads, these mosquitoes will carry it farther and farther and farther and it spread across the spread. But what I'll show you next slide, a time <coughs> the time lapse slide, a map of the United States. The red areas show where West Nile uh, was in 1902. Um, I'm not sure of the years. Over, over about a four or five year span. So each, each slide I show you sort of the spread of the spread. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right here. This gives you a this gives you an idea of how this other disease is. Okay, those are vector diseases. Vector diseases. The other category are contact diseases, and they're called crowd diseases. Those are the diseases that go directly from me to you and you to me. Typically through change of some bodily fluid. Most often, uh, that is water. Every time you breathe in, time you uh, inspire, uh, you <coughs> breathe in air around you. And in that air are tiny droplets of water, some of which have come from the rest of you. Every time you, um, you exhale, you blow it out. Part of your body works. And each of those tiny, tiny microscopic droplets of water contains various bacteria, microbes, acid, and In fact, beyond that, really interesting research going on right now. Uh, I've always known this, but looking a little more deeply about how we rely on these pearl We are host, incredible distributes, 
doing things sort of uh, sort of microwave. Most of them we would have to do <coughs> saying that we shouldn't use that soap that kills all the bacteria. You're not really helping that much. But some of course is that. And this is the basic thing. That's the bottom of Also um, water, drinking contaminated water. Diseases are uh, passed out of the body uh, through fecal matter. That gets into the water and contaminates the water. And then somebody else drinks that water, they will suggest the Blood, HIV, contaminated risk. Uh, uh, contaminated is uh, translated to blood semen. It puts some sort of bodily fluid. Uh, this is one of the you would. One of those uh, the virus. That is the fluid. Good symptoms, and then you begin to break down the rash, and the rash turns into blisters. The body is covered with blisters. The blisters burst, uh, and simply you move your scent. Very good. That's a bad situation. You're not dead already. Very hard. But you're not dead already. Like a shock, or a floor from a massive state of the world. There's an effect of the skin. I see the person. The only disease that people are set out to eradicate that's a thing. That's an idea of this kind of thing. That's all of us in our face. That's the most of the TV. There's a TV. There's a TV fixed. The problem is not. The only uh, smallpox exists today in only two places in the world.
or we don't. The rumor stuff, for example, back over the apartheid is stuff that that's not public. Okay, um, there was one disease that made it in the other direction. One disease that Indian people uh, seem to have given to uh, the old world, and that is syphilis and more specifically uh, venereal syphilis. There are various kinds of syphilis, especially the syphilis. The venereal syphilis is a much, uh, a much worse kind. In other countries. It appears, it seems to have appeared uh, in Europe right after the point of contact. It was much more uh, very much part of contact felt. And uh, the more we look at um, archaeological evidence, get this on other things that are wrong. Pre-contact skeletons in the New World here, uh, and ten, ten, uh, along with something that was there. And then suddenly it was in both places. It's pretty much confirmed, but it's still hard to uh, pretty much confirmed. It was along with the first of course is why? Why were there so many over there and not here? And the answer goes back to a point that I've done before. Contact disease. Contact disease are very, very young. The diseases go from person to person. And contact diseases are almost every one of them resulted in a disease jumping from an animal to a person. Uh, in other words, it was all close human animal contact. And that occurred only after the domestication of that. The old uh, When people began to domesticate cattle, horses, and pigs to chickens and live in close contact with them, literally, keep the cattle and then you can say, well, it's all. The solution to be to make their every one of these people who put out a protein originally as an animal and then with the species. But in the old world, most of them, so that all of those ancestors of domesticated animals would be extinct to the end of the outset. There were horses here, the horses were gone. The camels here, the camels were gone. So the Indian peoples had only those very, very few domesticated animals. And therefore, very, very none of those people. Seeing then is suddenly when these two worlds are brought together, these diseases that took thousands and thousands of years, at least 5,000, 10,000 years of development in the old world, were introduced instantly in the new world. And not one by one, but all together. So what you see then is suddenly this isolation of the new world is broken and they're flooded with these containers. And the result is said to be the worst thing that is going to happen. The continuing part is on uh, how bad it was. But uh, we can't say, I think, that uh, without question, that at least 50 to 60 percent of the new world population. Decline, and decline of at least 56% of the overall population within about 250 years. Some reported at 90 to 95. And that top 30 is the case in some areas. Places in Boston, New York, where it's nine, and the population dropped about 90 to 95. Years. Primarily because of the You have that kind of kill rate in the region. The economy collapses, uh, they get the right That is worth it. All blocks were probably the first. Your estimates, kind of Colombian contact. So 
from Seeger. This probably most consequential result of the Columbus Exchange was the decimation, crushing of the population of the human people. Not intentional. Well, I worked purposely in my not all the people who work in grass and graduates. So, yeah. Uh, probably not yet. Video on the physiology uh, of the public court. So far some critical mass probably probably not enough uh, people there. It's the same the thing about forming content, public court is not the first to get in the content. But by the time the public court contact Knowledge is all the points that really piece of it. Take that five of years when it's moved so much more of the system. But it's flood of people in the year of asking about this. Okay, um I've got a time here, but um, look up squatter. Right, what? Squatter. Well I can read. Two stories. Very, very difficult to look wider and darker than the one that we recycled on. Everybody needs to look at that. But the rich are also a pretty pretty off. Pretty off. Okay, you're right. Well, the only uh, as I say, the only one that we know of is uh, Sibyls. That's the uh, the only one that is Native American that has been a part of the old world. The Native uh, the world of diseases here, Papa virus, a virus that is still, still around, uh, but none of them compared to the Native American impact. Well, 
most population in the Western Hemisphere was Mesoamerica and the Northern South. Very dense population. And those populations, the dense population, the greater the impact. Do you have a map of your sites? Yeah. Do you balance people with the other land? In Europe, not the whole world. Yeah, but it's actually part of it. Just the Bureau of Things, I guess, is sort of clear. The European, Western European population, about the same thing, it's all the same. But within the years, very early. Further questions? Okay, I'm a little over, but I appreciate your attention. We'll uh, pick up for the uh, round two. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>